Welcome everyone to the Digital Military and STEM Career Day. SciTech Institute is extremely honored to have many veterans on our team, along with highlighting all of our guest speakers today. Tomorrow celebrates the 11th day of the 11th month of the 11th hour when the armistice was signed to end the First World War. And this is what we call our holiday, Veterans Day. Excellent, thank you so much, Brooke. We're so excited for today. Um, me personally, because I am one of those veterans at SciTech Institute that she mentioned. Good morning, my name is Kelly Green and I am the Chief Operating Officer of SciTech Institute and actually the creator of the Digital STEM Career Day. So really thrilled about November and to share a little bit about myself today as one of the um, presenters. Fun facts, my name is actually a shade of green. I grew up in a very small town in Western New York called West Clarksville on the farm with cows, but not um, dairy cows, we had beef. I have three older sisters. I played sports in high school. And at the young age of 17, I actually left for um, the United States Army and served for 21 years. Um, really interesting um, opportunity to get out of a small town and travel the world. I also included a really cute picture of my pit bull hound dog. His name is Remington. So when I left at the age of 17, I actually went to basic training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and attended my advanced individual training for logistics in Fort Lee, Virginia. It was a change in uh, lifestyle. Many of you will recognize that we always wear a uniform. We have specific ways to make our bed. But the really neat thing that I learned was that you could make friends from any background from any location in the United States and abroad. Um, when the war started in 2003, I was actually in Japan, but left and went to Iraq. Um, I spent about 18 months there and was serving as a machine gunner on the top of a Humvee. Now, when we arrived in theater, we did not have up armor. We had literally plywood and sandbags, so I'm really thankful that I came home safe. Um, they, the reason I'm sharing this is the innovation was happening while we were in um, country. They decided to design and engineer these blast side armor doors, but unfortunately they were too heavy for the 998 Humvee. So we would break an axle almost every time we went out on a mission and uh, it was very dangerous. But then later came the 1114, which was my favorite because we actually had a turret that would spin. So when I was out on a mission, um, I was able to feel a little bit more um, fancy and relevant. The other thing I wanted to note was that I also had the opportunity to design, create, and build this here Porter Cable donated uh, power tools to my team, two sets of cordless power tools. So we were always building and designing and creating things to keep our minds um, busy and create a fun space while we were in a dangerous location. Um, I didn't include it, but this is actually me building a little pool deck because my mom sent me an inflatable pool from Walmart while I was in Iraq. <laughs> In 2008, I went back um, to Iraq. This time I was stationed in Baghdad. I was not out in the country as often. I was more at the, I was at the core level with the 18th Airborne Corps. And we had teams all over Iraq. However, we had, I had a little bit more rank on my chest and was able to interact with the local schools. And I actually had the opportunity to lead the girl guides of Iraq in our victory based council. So these are photos of me with Iraqi um, school children and I focused on the girls and it was very similar to Girl Scouts. Um, so we met with them every Saturday to do activities and uh, it was really rewarding being in country and being able to uh, know that children everywhere can learn regardless of language barriers. Uh, 
the really nice part about this tour was that I didn't drive anywhere. I actually got to fly in the Black Hawk helicopters all over when visiting our teams. And it was just exciting. And I felt a lot safer than driving around on the ground. Again, I want you to think about um, a little bit of the sacrifice of missing every holiday, including your birthday, Christmas, Thanksgiving, but also every Wednesday, if you watch Survivor, right? Like you, you were gone for a long time and things continue to move quickly. So in 2012, I actually went back to the Middle East and I went to Afghanistan and I was serving all over the country with a task force unit as one of the female uh, support members of a team. And I was actually out of uniform. So um, it was a little scary, um, but exciting. There actually was snow on the borders of Pakistan. And as you can see here, different places to sleep. Some were overnight stays and some were a little bit longer. But um, again, that different type of country was exciting to learn more about and travel and see um, what was happening. We also had a chance to have USO tours while we were deployed. So I had the chance to meet some pretty cool people. I don't know if anybody knows the man in the red shirt. He's pretty popular. Um, if anybody wants to drop it in the chat. <laughs> but again, I had the chance to fly everywhere. I flew on every type of aircraft in country, including civilian and military vehicles um, or aircraft. And it's pretty neat that, you know, an Osprey, the way the engineering is designed or um, how much a Chinook can actually carry, but also flew in uh, much larger vehicles. I'll share here in a second. So my experiences with STEAM in the military really just Think about time, 20 years, there was a lot of advancement, not only in technology, but also um, transportation um, experiences. So I learned how to drive this very large truck called a five ton. But when I learned how to drive it, you actually had to shift into gear. But over those 20 years, they actually came up with the LMTV, which was push button, <laughs> which was uh, quite a training experience in itself, trying to teach um, old school two and a half ton uh, drivers to push a button to start the engine. Communications, which we have one of our teammates on, um, really developed over those 20 years as well. We went from dot matrix printers um, and analog computers to more intense um, spaces like this command room and signal from um, hardwired signal devices to satellite phones. So there was a lot that happened, um, worked with the Defense Intelligence Agency. We went from rockets and um, artillery that was the size of a vehicle to down to, you know, just the size of a, of a textbook. So it was incredible what I witnessed um, in those 21 years, the advancements. Uh, so now I'm retired, which has been Great, but I also work full time now with SciTech Institute. I get to share my leadership experiences and I get to mentor students, but I also get to enjoy the opportunities the retired life has to offer. The benefits of having retired from the military um, gives you access to different locations around the United States, including national parks, um, travel locations but it also has a wealth of friends across the nation and the world that I can connect with. Um, I also have a nephew who was inspired to join and served in the special forces. So um, love what I did, proud of my service and always take the time on Memorial today to remember my friends um, and teammates that were lost. But Veterans Day tomorrow is um, one of my favorite holidays to celebrate those that I served with and, you know, just really cherish the time I spent in uniform. Now at SciTech Institute, I serve as the Chief Operating Officer. As I mentioned, we encourage students in the Chief Science Officers Program to find their path, and it doesn't have to be straightforward. You can experience a variety of different things. And I'm not asking you to join the military if you're not comfortable with putting the uniform on but consider the Department of Defense as an option for a career. You can be a scientist, 
You can be a researcher. You can beta test different types of technology and equipment. You can learn a skill and come out with, um, you know, ready-made opportunities in the civilian world to make a decent living. My favorite part of um, working at SciTech Institute is that my Ideas and suggestions are valued and shared, especially with our friend here. This is Nova the Gecko. Um, he is our mascot for the Arizona SciTech Festival, which starts in January. It will be our 12th season of celebrating STEM and innovation across the state of Arizona. So mark your calendars. Um, again, just a few highlights. I love my dog. <laughs> I never had a uh, pet before because of my service in the military and don't have any children. Um, so getting a dog <laughs> during COVID was really one of my saving graces because uh, he really is soothing for those times when, um, if you think about the experiences I've had, having a companion is really nice. And he's just goofy, uh, 75 pounds of, of pure love. Thank you. It's nice to be here. So my name is Amanda Eager. Um, I'll share some facts about me too and, and how I ended up where I am as well. I am in the Army Reserves currently, so I am a first lieutenant in the Army. I also work for Paychex. I am more on the business side. I went to school for biochemical engineering, so I do have that STEM background. I grew up on a farm in New York quite like Kelly. Um, it was actually a hops farm, so that's what they used to make beer. I then moved to New Hampshire to go to University of New Hampshire, and that's where I got my engineering degree. I was also a STEM ambassador when I was a student there, so I worked with a lot of elementary and middle school kids doing different STEM events, quite like what you guys do. I joined the Army right when I turned 18. So I joined and I also did it during college as well. So I went through a program called ROTC where I did college and the army at the same time. That gave me a lot of opportunities to travel during college as well, really in between my summer months. So I got the chance to go to Kentucky, to Georgia, to Argentina, Tennessee, New Jersey, pretty much all over the United States during the summers of my college career. Then I moved all the way out to Arizona, where I have my reserve unit now. So with the reserves, I'm a medical logistics officer. So what that looks like is I'm in charge of nine different units equipment, um, making sure that they have the medical supplies that they need for any of their missions, um, and really working with those units to make sure that they're up on all of their supplies. So definitely went an interesting path here in the reserves. I do the one weekend a month and the two weeks in the summer, typically, just like the National Guard. So this summer, I actually went to California to Fort Hunter Liggett for my two weeks. So that was exciting. Um, that's basic background about me. And you can see some photos if I... Here we are now. So what I do currently is I work with technology companies for the most part or engineering companies and really helping them with their business side of things. So kind of a blend of both worlds, helping with the logistics, helping with the engineering, with the army, and then also with the business operations on my civilian side. Any questions for me? <laughs> We definitely want your um, your words of wisdom. Is that your last slide? Yes. So I think for me too, especially when I joined the army so young, I really needed direction in my life. I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do or what I wanted to go to school for. So it played a huge part in really figuring out what I wanted to be in life and the direction I wanted to go. Um, especially throughout the army, I've met friends all over the country and now all over the world at this point and it really has become my family so really just trust yourself you might not know what the future has to hold or where you're going to end up um, even with your college career or what you're doing currently and that's a hundred percent okay so really just trust yourself trust your in intuitions and and you're going to be okay at the end <laughs> 
So uh, my name is Fritz Smith. I was born in Georgia. I was born uh, near Atlanta, about the, the southwest metro area of Atlanta. Because um, Georgia is a big state, you've got Savannah on the coast, and you've got South Georgia, which is uh, basically Florida. So things change depending on what part of the state you're in. So I'm in a, a bit more of the the metropolitan area of Georgia, and so um, Atlanta is just right down the road for me. And so. I graduated high school in 2013, so about 10 years ago. And right after the uh, right after high school, and this is for this is for the high school kids. This is definitely um, sort of where because I was in high school, and I didn't know ex I knew I wanted to go to college in high school, but I wasn't really applying myself in high school to go to college. I was just kind of assuming it was going to happen just because that's what was expected of us to do. And I, like when I was in 10th grade, I wasn't, I didn't see myself as a college student. I just saw myself as, hey, I'm still in high school. I'm going to have fun. And I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Turns out um, when I was approaching graduation as a senior in high school, I didn't really have the, I didn't really have the advantages that I thought I was going to have, such as like grades or athletic scholarships. I was just kind of a, just a normal graduating high school guy. And I didn't have all of these um, college advantages that I was just assuming were going to fall into place, right? So my father's like, join the army, son. I was like, ah, okay. So I went and I talked to a recruiter and um, I actually talked to the Marines first. And I'm like, you want to be a special ops, underwater, elite, and you know, I was like, no, 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 like, I'm just trying to go to college. And um, so I talked to the Army Reserves, and they were able to really sell. They're really able to sell it. They're like, hey, look, if you can commit to the Army, we can commit to you. And they really made it, um, uh, they made it worth it. They made, they made it worth it. And so right after high school, I went to basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. So so I joined the army so I could actually like make it to college. And that's what happened. I joined the army. Um, they gave me college uh, student loan bonuses. And so I was able to do the army reserves once a month while I went to school in uh, Tennessee, where I studied theology and philosophy. And so while I was studying in college, I was doing my army drill in, uh, one week in the month and two weeks during the year. And towards the end of my studying theology and philosophy in Tennessee. This is about 2018. I was deciding what I wanted to do next. And I found a really interesting program at Arizona State University called a Master's of Science and Technology Policy, which involves uh, learning about uh, United States laws and regulations regarding science and technology, mostly technology. Um, so everything as incredible as uh, like the future of nuclear energy to um, just the the Federal Aeronautics Administration, like how are we going to regulate the uh, emissions of uh, engine turbines? So there's a lot of different things that go into how we wield our technology. And so uh, what I do in SciTech and the Army. So what I do in SciTech is at SciTech, I work with the development team developing, um, for lack of a better term, biggering, biggering and developing SciTech as an organization. And uh, most of that work I do is digital. I work remotely from Georgia. I still, I live in Georgia now. So most of the work that I do for SciTech is remote, it's digital. And this involves researching companies that we would wanna reach out to, inputting those companies and cataloging that data in our uh, software, and I I write uh, for the our website and our posts on social media sometimes, and so that's what I do on the SciTech side of my my job life, and then my army in my army life what I did um, oh this is Shaquille Shaquille O'Neal by the way, uh, how about that he's so tall I met him at the airport when we were going on some training. So, um, I laughed because so I put arms, that in the chat. I was like, "Oh my gosh, you look so tiny!" <laughs> yes, yes, I know, right? Shaquille O'Neal is so tall. Um, 
And so, uh, uh, so in the army, I, I was, and tech, I still am a, in the signal Corps. Well, I am trained as a 25 Lima, which is a fiber optic maintenance and installation specialist. However, I haven't worked with fiber optics lately because I am in a new unit. I'm in the 803rd Quartermaster Company. I'm a squad leader. I'm a sergeant in that unit. And so far, most of my actual duties are uh, being an NCO. And what that looks like is just managing um, the operations training. And so in the army, I was a trained as a fiber optic and cable specialist. I was on a team responsible for the physical connectivity of the signal core, because a lot of people in the signal core are out there um, working on satellites on their army laptops. And they're always frustrated, like, oh, the satellite didn't know that we were going to be talking to the satellite today. And so we've got to call someone and they always figure it out. And in the meantime, me and my team will take the fiber optics and connect it to the satellite, and then we'll take it to whoever needs connectivity in that training um, in the out in the field and what have you. And so that was, uh, that was a good, that was a good career in the military because I got a lot, I got to spend a lot of time with my team and we could work, we would work really hard together on the front, like when we would set up, uh, when we would set up shop. Um, and then when uh, everything was set up, as long as everything was green and working, we uh, we were good to go. And so with all of that, uh, I'll move to my next slide. And here's uh, some fun facts and wisdom. So I love, I love, uh, you know, a good, good saying, good wisdom sayings as much as, as the next person. But when, what I look for in a, in a wisdom saying is something that I can actually apply to my life. And it doesn't necessarily just make me uh, just sort of feel necessarily uh, good. Um, so, for example, uh, Confucius, there's this saying, this uh, ancient Chinese proverb, like the person who chases two rabbits catches neither. I think that is a great, I think that's great advice because that's something that you can really bring down to earth in your own life from the small level. Like if you're multitasking, like trying to do two things at once, you're going to do neither of those things as well as you could have if you just did one thing and then moved on to the next thing, just one thing at a time. And then you can look at on the big scale, big picture, where it's like if you're going to college or you're going working on a, on your career or even a relationship, it's like focus on one thing and that thing will, that is going to be, because if you try and do two things at once, too many things at once, then it's a lot harder for those things to really um, just be as good as they otherwise could have been. And then I like the one, I love the Gandalf quote, um, where it says, all we have to, to decide, all we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to us. I like that because it's true. We only, we only have so much time in our lives from birth to the end. And it's what we decide to Put our time with like how do we spend our time here as are these conscious mortals just how do we spend our time i think that's really important and make time for what to make time for what you enjoy um and then uh this is the coolest dinosaur the therizinosaurus i didn't know about this one when i was young i only recently learned about it and if i knew about the dinosaur with wolverine claws when i was a kid it would have been my favorite the whole time but uh that's the end of my presentation. I am Jake Lounsbury, and I'll start with who I am and a little bit about my military career. I got my cool Stetson on. You know that it's a military hat because we do weird things with stuff, and mine's got a chin strap because, you know, most cowboy hats don't have that. Um, and it follows the tradition of the U.S. Cavalry um, back in the... Uh, mid 1800s to the early 1900s and what the Stetson symbolizes is that there's several things my rank when I retired which is a sergeant is here I was a cavalry scout which is a 19 delta uh, and everybody asked me what that is now because we don't have horses and I just remind them that I had uh, 469 horses under the hood depending on the day so and then I have this 
um, yellow set of cords that goes around. Now my cords are different than everybody's because mine are tied. So if you were a cavalry scout who was in combat, they tie your cords. If you see that they're long cords, they haven't been in combat yet. I also have a pair of gold spurs, which goes back because we have a lot of traditions. So that is why I'm wearing my Stetson. I only ever get it out for Memorial Day, the 4th of July, and Veterans Day. Uh, the rest of the time it sits on display. So um, I was in the Army for nine years and 284 days because I was actually hurt on my deployment in Afghanistan and was medically retired just short of my 10-year uh, initial contract. Um, some fun facts about myself is all my brother's names. I have two brothers for all J's. So it's Jake, Josh, and Joe. So I grew up in a house that when my mom was trying to get somebody's attention, she'd go, Jake, Josh, Joe, Joe, Jake, Josh. And you knew the last name was the one she wanted. But if you were in trouble, you just pretend it like you didn't hear it. Hear it. So that, that's a fun fact. I also grew up on a farm. However, mine was uh, corn and beets. I grew up in Michigan and I'm still in Michigan. I was a firefighter and I currently am a firefighter again. I'm actually in my class B uniform for that today because I was there at seven o'clock in the morning. Um, and it's a polo, so it looks good on Zoom. <laughs> I didn't have to change. Um, I do a lot of CrossFit because after I got out of the Army, I found out that uh, I got soft really fast without being in some sort of gym type situation. And I'm one of those individuals that to work out, I need someone to yell at me apparently. So I go to a CrossFit gym where a coach tells me to move faster and pick up lots of weights. Um, I spend a lot of time in the outdoors. I hunt, I fish, I camp, I hike. And then the other cool fact about myself is I'm a writer. Now, when I say I'm a writer, it's a very broad and diverse term. You can do all sorts of different writing. And I have done all sorts of different writing. I was, uh, I wrote a newspaper column for a while, just all freelance work. Um, so it's more of a hobby, but I had enough published that I can, I like to consider myself a published writer. I also worked for video game companies, all the stories, when you look at the old video games and it would scroll all these words up that you would have to read because there weren't voice actors and everything else. I wrote a lot of that for video games. There was a game called Eve Online. It's actually still out. I wrote for them. Um, I wrote for a company called FASA. They had a game called Battletech and um, Mac Warrior. And when that, that, those went digital, I wrote some of those um, game things. So I am a super nerd, which you can kind of move this way. You can kind of tell with my uh, art in the back, there's like a Captain America um, comic book cover and a Spider-Man painting and a Yoda quote, because these are things that I find entertaining. Um, we always tell everybody I am Jake from Michigan. I'm not Jake from State Farm. I don't wear khakis usually. I usually wear jeans. Um, and most of the students are like, what is he talking about? Because they don't remember that commercial because it was so long ago. Um, really, I've had kind of a multi-potentialite career or Jake of all trades, if you will. I have a degree in teaching. Um, I joined the military late, much like Anthony did. So when I joined, I was 27 years old and I was in as a Calvary Scout. So I went to basic combat training in Fort Knox, Kentucky, where the average age of someone there was, oh, how did I get into video game writing? I'll come to that one in just a second. That's a good one. Um, well, we'll go to, right to that question because I, I, Lord knows I can get distracted easily. So video game writing actually happened I started, so again, I'm a nerd. I played role-playing games as a kid because we didn't have all the video games that y'all have now. Like we had the regular Nintendo or the Atari. Um, and I played role-playing games and strategy games and the, and the group called FASA would put out these books that were like quests and they allowed people who played to send in ideas. So at like 17 years old, I sent them an idea and they liked it and they added it to one of their quest books. And from there, there was a magazine, I don't know if it's even still published, called Dragon Magazine. I wrote a fantasy story and someone read it and said, hey, we're creating this video game. Would you like to help us? And I said, sure. And it was, it was really, really fun. But at the time I was a freelance writer and a kid and I didn't know any better. And I think I got paid $80 for like 50 pages worth of stuff because I didn't know what was going on. But I continued to build connections after that. Like I, I met that editor and he would know other editors and they would have projects that they could do. And 
you reached out and you did those projects for other companies. And I came back to FASA when they started going digital and they said, you did some good quests for us. Can you write for our new video game, Mech Warrior 2? From there, I made a connection with a company in, of all places, Iceland. Uh, they were called CCP, which for those of you know, that's also like the symbol for the Chinese Socialist Republic, but that's not what the company meant. Um, and they asked if I would help them start coming up with their background storyline. And I took that as a yes and was really excited about it. And I wrote a lot of the, like, I really got to nerd out because they gave me some basic premise and I got to create like the worlds that everybody was going to be in. And that was probably the, the last time I worked in the video game industry because a lot of the video game industry now, if you're, if you're interested in getting into that, is in-house. So I did what's called freelance work. So I was a, a contractor, if you will. Now they keep their writers in-house. So you would apply to Blizzard or you would apply to CCP or you would apply to, um, oh, I think Info Games is another really good one that's out there right now. Um, so oh, what's my favorite dinosaur? <laughs> and why is it Stegosaurus? Hang on for a second. You're gonna get me distracted because it's not Stegosaurus. Um, so going through the video game process i did that freelance one but i will tell you it was it was a much different industry at the point because video games started making money like the video game industry for everybody that thought you get rich on it way back in the day was not a get rich situation now it is because i wrote some stuff i remember getting my first paycheck from ccp and their their accounting firm was actually in the united kingdom and i get a check in the mail because this was a while ago so they didn't auto deposit it. I get a check in the mail from London and I look at it and it's got this strange number on it and a weird sign on it. And I didn't know what it meant, but I was like, wow, I got 800 or whatever this is. Well, it was pounds. And for eight pages, I got paid $1,400. And all of a sudden, everything I started writing started to be worth more money. So as a freelance person, if you look, I've got this great big bookshelf behind me. A couple of the books on it are what's called the Writer's Marketplace. If you're interested in getting into writing, I would suggest you get the Writer's Marketplace. I would also suggest that you read a lot of how to hone and edit your stuff because in the beginning, I got a lot of denials because they have editors, but their editors really don't want to be that busy correcting your grammar and things like that. So pay attention to your language arts teacher, pay attention to your spelling, don't just count on your computer for it, and have fun. Um, my favorite dinosaur is the Utah Raptor. And the reason it's the Utah Raptor is it's basically a velociraptor that's like 20 feet tall. So I appreciate that it was a very intelligent dinosaur that was big, I guess. So I've always liked all the raptors. The, the little known fact for everybody when they look at uh, Jurassic Park and stuff like that, and you see a velociraptor, that's not actually a velociraptor. It's a, a Dionysius is what they call them, I believe is the correct pronunciation. Because a velociraptor was actually very tiny. They were only like four or five feet tall. They weren't almost as tall as a person. Um, so yeah, that's how big a nerd I am because I knew that immediately. Um, man, I didn't even get through my second slide. Sorry, Kelly. There we go. And th this is my second side. So I am the director of global partnerships for SciTech. And when I say multi potentialite, that's why I am where I am. Like I came into this situation fairly lucky. I got my job because I was introduced to the chief science officers program because the teacher who was supposed to take two students to it got a bellyache and couldn't go. And my principal called and said, could you chaperone two students? And while I sat in that training and got really excited for what was going on with the kids, I said, hey, does anybody have any Middle Eastern experience? Well, I'd spent 13 months in Afghanistan. I learned to speak Pashto. I spent a lot of times in what are called KLEs, which are key leader engagements. So I was in negotiations with colonels and warlords, basically, all through Afghanistan along the Pakistani border. And so I knew the ins and outs of proper etiquette. And one thing led to another, and I love what I do. And I get to do all sorts of different things. Like my day never looks the same, which is one of the things I love about my job. Like I could be with students. I could be with the minister of education in Kuwait. I could be 
having a meeting with Kelly where she assigns me some tasks. It just depends on the day. And um, it's a pretty broad idea. And I still write on the side. And like I said, I still firefight on the side because it's a on-call station. So that is me in a nutshell. With the Arizona National Guard, uh, our mission in the National Guard is to protect the homeland. And in being in the Arizona National Guard, believe it or not, we have been all over the world to support federal missions as well as state missions. And when it comes to state missions, we support other states that may be going through uh, different uh, situations. So in the top corner there, um, this uh, looks like a fire that is um, that is a fire from uh, California when they had their huge fires in in uh, Northern California, the Arizona National Guard responded. We sent helicopters with these giant buckets called a, a Bambi bucket and they fly down and they scoop up water from uh, lakes and then they go to uh, a fire and drop water on those to protect uh, structures and to uh, protect people's homes and, and businesses and roads and things like that. So we did support that. Uh, we also help when uh, hikers get lost or stranded. And uh, the, the picture of the helicopter there is, is a, a rescue that one of our pilots uh, ended up doing. And, and if I remember correctly, they had to hover next to uh, a ledge to try and get the person into the helicopter and, and off the mountain. And uh, it was uh, one of my, my good friends, she's a female helicopter pilot here, and uh, she did an amazing job. Um, we also do uh, fire uh, flood response. Recently, we had fires up in the Northern Arizona that uh, burned a lot of land. And then when the rains come along, they cause flooding because that water has nowhere to go, nothing to stop it and, and prevent it from uh, running down the mountains and um, it causes flooding in, in people's homes. So we did send a, a bunch of folks to go and protect property. Uh, uh, I believe our combat engineers supported with uh, creating uh, sandbags and then also trying to divert the, the earth, build it up in different areas. Um, I, I really like the picture in the middle. Uh, there's a big old black blob there. I'm not sure if you can see what that is. That is actually a lava flow. And the Arizona National Guard has a special team called a CST. It's a civil support team and civil meaning our, our different states. And they happen to specialize in uh, nuclear biological uh, situations. So basically, our team was sent to uh, the big island of Hawaii when the volcanoes were flowing uh, lava into local towns. Um, and the reason we, we, we sent our group is that uh, they have special equipment that can monitor the air quality. And when volcanoes uh, spew their lava or the lava flows, it actually emits a lot of hazardous um, uh, toxins in the air. And, and actually, it could be one of those things that uh, if a human inhales it, they end up going to sleep forever. And so it was very important that uh, our team be there to assure that the villages that were being impacted by the lava flow had clean air. And uh, it was funny because um, I was talking to one of the teams, the team commander, and he said that uh, in the middle of the night, uh, there's these little frogs that chirp all night long. And whenever the uh, lava flow started to emit higher levels of, of uh, toxic fumes, these um, frogs would stop chirping and then their, their system would go off. So it was pretty amazing that nature has a, a natural um, alert system for, for people. Um, in STEM in the net military, we, we have many different types of STEM. Here in the Arizona National Guard, we have handheld drones where our infantry actually takes these, these drones and they launch them like a like a paper plane, I guess you could say, just like he is standing there. And uh, what those do is they gather data and information in the, the battlefield and can be hand carried into remote areas, which I really think is cool. Not that I've 
wanted to spend the night out with the infantry, but uh, I think it's pretty cool that they have a tool that they can use to gather information. We also have a cyber team. This cyber team is amazing. In fact, um, I'm sure you've heard on the news that that there have been bad actors out there trying to hijack data from different organizations. And our team supported Colorado when uh, one of the Colorado towns uh, had all of their data seized by uh, uh, a pirate or a hacker. And um, our team was able to get their data back without having to pay the ransom. So yay, go team. Um, we also have, like I said, Blackhawks. If you're here in Arizona, our, you can see Blackhawks right off the uh, McDowell Road. And uh, it's, it's pretty cool to see them. And I've been very fortunate to fly several times with them um, all over Arizona. Uh, we also have an F-16 unit and we also, down in Tucson, and down in Tucson, we also have a, a drone unit. It's a, um, they actually fly remotely in foreign countries. Uh, right now, I, well, actually, can't really talk about that, but uh, where they are now is what I mean. <laughs> I can't talk about where they are now, but uh, just know that we have pilots that are remotely flying drones in other countries from Arizona. So I think that's pretty dang cool that we have the technology to be able to do that. Um, so when I think about other STEM though, we can think about finance. Finance is, is so important, especially to those of us that like to get our paycheck. And uh, medical, we had a lot of support. Uh, we supported a lot of the COVID missions with uh, medical support. We were on uh, reservations, distributing the COVID vaccine to different areas. We actually assisted early on in the COVID mission when um, truckers were unable to get their loads to different areas. We were able to uh, connect those those trucks and deliver supplies throughout Arizona uh, during COVID, the height of COVID. We have an engineering uh, group, and and they actually uh, it, it was really great when I was on uh, when I was the lead, the J1 is what it is. I'm the lead HR person for uh, missions. Uh, we actually had a mission down to Nogales, Arizona, uh, where they had to work with Car Corps of Army Engineers and they had to prevent uh, flooding that was coming northbound from Mexico and they ended up using big trucks to uh, uh, land movers to, to move. Um, we also have a weather unit and that's very, very important for our um, uh, flying missions and also our, our uh, drones. Um, one of the, the way of the future, um, we have a new thing called live and it's basically the use of um, avatars to assist people with having difficult conversations. So sometimes we have to tell people uh, that um, maybe their behavior is inappropriate. And sometimes it's hard to know how to say those, those words, how to how to go through those conversations. And live is a, a cool way that we're using technology to help people that may have to have difficult conversations with other, with soldiers and airmen to have those in a practice area. The avatar actually responds to what the, uh, the, the person, the, the leader is, is saying. And it's funny because the avatar can actually have reactions like uh, start crying, they can start crying or they can start yelling or they can stomp out of the virtual office, but it's super cool. And uh, I'm excited to be one of the lead trainers for the National Guard on, on that. Um, and why do we have live? Because we, we are looking to make our force incredibly diverse. And we wanna assure that if you have a desire to raise your right hand and say, I wanna serve the military, that, that you have a place where you can feel confident and, and you can be the best person, best soldier, airman that you can be um, based on what your desires are to learn and grow. So basically that's all I have and I'm open to any questions. I like the, um, the culture wheel that you had at the end there. Oh, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh. Um, sure. Let me let me uh, reshare it real quick. Um, a break. Oh. 
Okay, so um, when it comes to the culture wheel, we know that, uh, especially with the National Guard, we're, we're, our mission is to protect the homeland. And that means that we should be a reflection of the communities that we are in. So in Arizona, we have uh, several uh, uh, reservations and uh, for our, our Native uh, Americans. And we definitely want to assure that people in those communities feel welcome in the National Guard and, and that um, their experiences and their language are so important. So when we think about language, if you go back to uh, the code talkers, Navajo code talkers, um, it was because of them that that we were able to to see an end to the, the world war. Um, they, they used their native language to um, prevent the Japanese from being able to, to figure out strategic plans. And so mm -hmm. um, it's, it, we value those cultures. Had we not had that diversity in our organization, we might not have had the success we had in, in that, that, uh, that war. Um, the arts, just, just knowing how, uh, you know, Kelly is, is an amazing speaker and she always is. And I think that's part of her, her artsy background of, of um, being expressive and, and being very um, good at public speaking and a quick thinker and all of this. So those are our skills that we're looking for. We're looking for those. Uh, and and um, when we think about um, techniques and skills, sometimes uh, I heard several of the guest speakers talk about having backgrounds on, on farms. That, that can be an important tool, especially if we have soldiers or airmen in a, a foreign country that may not know uh, where there might be safe areas to find water or, or safe uh, things to eat. And so because of those backgrounds, we're able to be a more uh, effective and uh, balanced team. So it's, it's important to, to value every person that, that raises their hand because we all have skills and qualities that we bring to the table that can be used to forward our missions. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think culture is very interesting. And... Hello, everyone. My name is Brian Green, and I am a first sergeant in the Arizona Army National Guard. I'm sorry I could not be live with you today because I'm doing training in Austin, Texas. I'm here today to talk to you about my career in the United States Army. So why did I join? Well, I grew up in a not so great area and my school did not show me all the amazing STEM opportunities that all of you get to see and experience today. I graduated high school, met and married an amazing woman and realized I needed a career and not a job. I enlisted as a UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter mechanic. I went to basic training and then to school to learn how to fix helicopters. So my first assignment was at Fort Hood, Texas. This is where I learned how to take a helicopter almost all the way apart, make sure that the parts were good, cleaned, inspected, and put back together correctly. Now this is where I learned the importance of my career or my job. If I didn't follow all the directions correctly and put everything back, the helicopter would break. And a helicopter is not like a car. You can't pull over on a cloud. After my time in Texas, I was sent to South Korea. This is where I got training to become a crew chief. I'm sure you've seen enough movies or video games to see that person on the side of the helicopter with that big gun. Yeah, that's me. But a crew chief's job isn't just to shoot a gun, but it's also to make sure that that helicopter is fit to fly. If it breaks, it needs to be fixed as soon as possible to make sure that the mission is complete. So that reminds me of a time when we were training. It was so cold that our tent froze to the ground and it took us an hour to chip all of that ice away from the tent just to put it away. Not to mention all the snow and ice that had to come off the helicopters before we could fly and make a mission. Now being from Arizona, South Korea was a different world to me. Now after Korea, I was sent back to Texas. I got to do some really fun stuff like put out fires with Bambi buckets. You know those big orange buckets that hang below the helicopters? I know you guys have seen those, right? 
I've also uh, picked up and dropped off Humvees with the helicopter, and I've done many VIP missions. In 2003, I deployed to Iraq for Operation Iraqi Freedom. I was a crew chief responsible for transporting supplies and troops into harm's way. These missions required me to utilize some of my STEM skills. Flying people and cargo added weight to the helicopter, and the more and the more weight, the more power that was required to pick up that weight. So I had to do lots of math to calculate whether or not that helicopter could pick up the weight. And I also had to do fuel calculations while flying to ensure we had enough gas to make it there and more importantly, to make it back. After Iraq, uh, I left the Army for about seven years or so and then uh, I ended up joining the uh, Arizona Army National Guard and worked at a place called the Western Army National Guard Aviation Training Site. I was a helicopter mechanic and crew chief uh, for the Guard. I got to take lots of trips to places like Pennsylvania, Alabama, California, and you know all kinds of different places to pick up, fix, and bring back helicopters to Arizona. And on the way, I got to see lots of cool stuff on my trip. Uh, I seen Hershey, Hershey Pennsylvania, Gettysburg, uh, I got to do a really cool flyby of Meteor Crater. Uh, that was uh, a lot of fun and an amazing time and, a, and, a, uh, and an adventure, to say the least. So, at this time in my career, I had gained a lot of experience, and the place I worked also trained soldiers to do the job that I was already doing. An opportunity came about when my unit got some new helicopters, the UH-72 Lakota. I was asked to be an instructor and train new people on how to train others to be crew chiefs, if that makes sense. Uh, and this was a challenge for me. I was nervous just standing up in front of people presenting something for a short period of time. Now I have to be the teacher standing in front of the class. Oh boy, it was, it was nerve wracking, but with some time and some practice, uh, it got comfortable as I still, uh, as I learned how to do the job. Uh, not only was I learning a new skill as a teacher, though, I had the responsibility of training and managing other instructors to become crew chief trainers. Within the next few years, I flew over 1,700 flight hours. I trained 15 instructors to become crew chief trainers and instructed and graduated over 300 Army students. I became what was called an subject matter expert in my career, or an SME, meaning, meaning People from all over the country would call me about questions they had about things that I did in my job or my career field. Uh, it was very rewarding and I enjoyed being a teacher. I enjoyed the looks on faces when they had that aha moment uh, and those were priceless to me. I'll never forget my time as an instructor. Now while all this was happening, I took advantage of a great, I took advantage of, you know, great army programs. We bought a house and I didn't need to pay that 20% down payment. Now you, uh, you might not know what that is, but I know your parents know what that big 20% down, 20 down payment is. I get 30 days of paid vacation every year. You're not gonna find that in a civilian job. Free medical, mm-mm. Uh, I got paid schooling. So I used that to earn my bachelor's degree, which I got a 3.89 uh, GPA. And then I got my master's degree in business management with a 4.0 GPA. Uh, and most of that was, most of that all, almost all of that schooling was free. I have earned an airframe and power plant license. What's that mean? That means I have the ability to go out and fix and maintain civilian helicopters and planes. I have taken uh, safety courses. And like I said, right now I'm in a class that is now teaching me how to become an accident investigator. So I think that's pretty cool. Right now, uh, right now what I'm doing is I'm a first sergeant and deputy commandant uh, for the uh, NCOA Academy. So I'm sure all that is just Greek to you guys. Uh, but basically what that means is, is I'm the vice principal of an army school. Now this position has pushed me way out of my box. It has shown me the importance of like networking uh, and prioritizing and that big one that everybody uh, has trouble with, time management. You know what I'm saying. Uh, I just recently uh, had a trip to Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C., and I needed all those skills to be successful on that trip. Now, I have done, seen, and learned a lot in my Army career. None of this was given to me. 
I worked hard and did what others did not want to do. This launched me into the position that I'm in now. My career in the Army provided me with the opportunity to grow as a person and provide for my family. I'm sharing my story not because I want you to join the Army, it's not why I'm here. I'm sharing my story to show you that if you work hard and go the extra mile, it's less crowded. Thank you for listening to, uh, to my story and I hope you enjoy the rest of the STEM conference and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much. So, uh, like I said, good morning. My name is Andrew. I am currently a staff sergeant in the U.S. Army, a former sergeant in the Marine Corps. Uh, my background is primarily in intelligence, and I'm going to give just a brief presentation on uh, how STEM uh, ties into everything that we do in military intelligence. So, a little bit of background. Oh, can you see the long-haired version of me, or, or uh, is it getting blocked right now? Because I'm, I'm, I can't see me. But, well, we can see you. Can <laughs> okay, perfect, you. perfect. Because I, I I just see the panel on the side. And I'm like, oh no, I wanted everybody to see the the long hair. You know, you got to get full full circle. So a uh, little bit of background about myself. I'm originally from a uh, small town in Illinois. I graduated out of a class of uh, 42 students. About 25 of those students, we uh, started kindergarten together. So it was a K through 12 uh, school. It was a town of about a thousand people, and I just kind of daydreamed about traveling the world and and getting out of small town Illinois. Uh, on my day-to-day, -day, you know, regular schedule. I had never been in an airplane before, and so uh, when I decided to enlist in the uh, Marine Corps, all I saw was all expenses paid trip to uh, San Diego, California. So I was like, all right, I, 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 let's just see where this goes. I have to, I have to take this opportunity. Um, as, it, as it turned out, I, I ended up enlisting as a cryptologic linguist. Um, so I was assigned Russian, so I spent about a year learning Russian. Um, and then once I was done with uh, my MOS school, I ended up going to a battalion where I did uh, two overseas deployments. Uh, one was to Iraq. The other one was to, uh, I was stationed on a bunch of different ships. So we actually did a, a few different countries, but the uh, most significant was Kenya. While I was in Kenya, I was doing counter piracy operations. And uh, so I ended up doing one particular mission that took me to Kenya where there was a, uh, a Ukrainian vessel that had 33 T-72 tanks on board that was hijacked and held for ransom. Uh, so that got me into Kenya and I had the time of my life while I was there. So at that point, by the time I left, I decided I'm definitely going back to Kenya. So by the time I got out of the Marine Corps, I had already made up my mind. I uh, ended up just packing a backpack and running away to East Africa where I lived for six years. And that's where the, the long hair picture comes in. So um, I ended up coming back to the United States and then uh, I decided I wanted to come back onto active duty because I, I kind of missed being in the military at that time. I wanted to come back and see what, uh, what I might be missing out on. And uh, so that's how I ended up in the army and uh, my job is in geospatial intelligence, which I'm going to go into in just a little bit. So uh, I have a total of eight and a half years in military intelligence. Okay, so just a brief overview of uh, fields of military intelligence. We have uh, signals intelligence and electronic intelligence, which just focuses primarily on um, intercepting communication and electronic signals. And uh, I'm going to give like a little bit more of an in-depth background on this uh, on the next slide and just give a couple examples. 
Um, and then you have measurement and signature intelligence, which is the detection of certain characteristics or signatures like emissions. Uh, you have human intelligence, which focuses on intelligence from human sources. So you're talking to people face to face, you're, you're building uh, relationships with people. And then you have geospatial intelligence, which is primarily uh, imagery in the form of satellite imagery or stuff that's fed from, uh, from different aircraft and also geospatial data that's used for intelligence purposes. Uh, OSINT is open source intelligence. So basically it's data that's available to the public. So anything that, that you could just go on and do a Google search for, uh, anything that you could jump on social media and find, it's stuff that is open to the public. It's not classified in any way, but when you combine it, you can end up getting some kind of intelligence value out of it. Uh, the next point is for counterintelligence. So basically counterintelligence focuses on preventing espionage. And it applies in uh, domestic scenarios, so like here in the United States, but also international and then uh, from a counter counterterrorism perspective. And then uh, at the bottom, we have all source intelligence, which basically is just every single source of intelligence, like the ones that are listed in the bullets above. Uh, we have analysts that end up uh, kind of aggregating all of those single sources of intelligence and then processing that information so that it becomes digestible to whoever the customer may be. So it, after 9-11, uh, after it was kind of a, identified that this, this area where we were lacking was that there wasn't one particular person that could kind of take a little bit from every source of intelligence and then make it into a product. Um, it, instead, you had a bunch of people that were focusing on single sources of intelligence and they weren't really communicating very well. So now we have all source intelligence analysts that are the ones responsible for combining everything. So the role of STEM in military intelligence. Uh, in signals intelligence and electronic intelligence, we have uh, what's known as signal detection and spectrum analysis. So basically, and before I get into this, right, uh, Brooke had told me, uh, I just want you to give a, a little bit of a talk and, and just explain how STEM is relevant to what you do in the military. And so I, I thought about it and I, I thought to myself, what would my job be if it wasn't for advances in STEM? And the answer is simple, I would not have a job. So anything that is in military intelligence is 100% reliant on developments that happen in the fields of particularly science and technology, uh, but also engineering and mathematics and everything that kind of comes with that. So signals intelligence was what I was involved in first as a, as a linguist. Um, and like I mentioned before, it's basically the interception of uh, communication signals. So we're, we're dealing with stuff like now in present day, it's uh, cellular communication, so phone calls and stuff like that. But if you, uh, even if you dumb it down a little bit further, you're talking about radio, so just radio frequencies, um, the ability to uh, build an antenna out of, out of nothing and then intercept, uh, you know, walkie talkies, for example. Um, and then signal detection and uh, spectrum analysis is basically if, uh, if any signal is uh, propagated, then, you know, it pops up on a screen and then you can identify where it is, where it originated from, and then you can uh, pursue it a little bit further. Um, ECM is electronic countermeasures. So uh, basically, and it kind of ties in with the last two points there, jamming and spoofing. Uh, basically, if you want to interrupt somebody's ability to collect on you. So in the case of jamming, it's your, you're sending so many signals that uh, you can't pick up on one particular signal. Or in the case of spoofing, you're, uh, you're acting, like for example, you're acting like you're a cellular tower. And by the way, this is all unclassified. Just so I'm, 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 not, I'm not spilling anything that, uh, that shouldn't be talked about. You can, you can Google all of this stuff. Um, so electronic countermeasures uh, and then direction finding and terminal guidance is basically uh, I, I identifying where a person is located based off of where they're transmitting a signal from. So it can be uh, through, the, through the means of triangulation as to where the signal is, uh, is coming from, or it can be used uh, with something like GPS to determine like down to the exact point where somebody is. Um, measurement and signature intelligence. Uh, this is a little more technical. This is actually is not my bread and butter, but we're talking about radio frequencies. Uh, Electro-optical uh, is basically it, and that actually goes in with GeoN. So it's basically, uh, you, you, you can detect change, right? So it's any kind of signature that uh, you, you identify that, there, that a change has taken place in a, in a particular environment. Um, radar is something that I'm also going to go into in geo into the next uh, in the next point. Uh, but basically, uh, you're you're pumping out a signal and then you're getting a return back off of it. Uh, nuclear, if there's any kind of nuclear signature that can be detected, uh, we have 
uh, instruments that measure that. And same thing with geophysical and materials emissions is basically like anything that changes in the physical environment, we're able to identify those changes even on like a molecular level. So if there's if there's a change in like the uh, the normal uh, gases that are in the atmosphere, like stuff like that can be detected with the uh, the equipment that we use. Um, Geospatial intelligence. So we're talking about electro-optical, infrared, and uh, synthetic aperture radar satellite technology. So this is kind of the bread and butter of what I do in the Army right now. Um, we have a bunch of satellites that are, you know, constantly orbiting the Earth, and uh, and they're taking pictures. So if you've ever used Google Maps, for example, or if you've ever used Google Earth, uh, these are commercial satellites that are that are orbiting the Earth that are just taking pictures everywhere that they go. So that's why if you want to you know, find your way from point A to point B anywhere in the United States in particular, or even uh, abroad, uh, you're, you're able to get access to that. And it's because of the uh, commercial satellites. Um, UAVs is uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, and then FMV is full motion video. So we're talking about drones. We're talking about planes that uh, don't have any, any manned uh, personnel on it. They're actually uh, operating them remotely. And then they have cameras on the on the underside of them, so that you're you're taking full motion video, so you're actually streaming what is uh, what is going on, and you know it's flying high enough that you can take a a pretty wide aperture, and you can take take in a lot of what's going on uh, in a particular uh, area of operations. Uh, we have uh, reconnaissance aircraft, and then TGS is a tactical intelligence ground station. So basically, it's like a, a Humvee. I think I have a picture in the next slide. Um, or in a couple slides. It's a Humvee that uh, is basically like a, a workstation where you have like all your computers and stuff inside and you can put the antennas out outside of it and then you can collect um, everything that's, uh, that's going on. Uh, MTI is moving target indicator. So basically it's a radar technology that allows you to identify, um, you know, different traffic patterns. It's better for um, vehicles, moving vehicles and stuff like that. Uh, it's actually really neat. And then CCD is coherent change detection. So if you want to see like, for example, if a, uh, a missile was tested at a particular like uh, launch testing site, uh, you can detect the changes like over time so that here on day one, it looks like nothing has happened, but then uh, on day three, assuming that they did a, a missile test on day two, you're going to see drastic changes in the environment where there's like, uh, you, you can tell that a rocket took off, right? So there's, there's, and these are really minute changes, right? So you could look at two different pictures and you could see that something is burned, but these are like really minute changes where you could, you could tell the difference if like, you know, a vehicle is driven down a gravel road uh, within a day or two, for example. Um, open source intelligence. Uh, this is something that's open to everybody. Uh, and there's actually some really cool things that you can do online now um, in the form of capture the flag type of activities and stuff um, where, you know, they give you a particular uh, targets, if you will, or objectives and say like, you know, go and find this. And then you, you go online and you can search through different media sources or social media and different websites. Uh, public service announcements. These are things that are not classified that you can just go on any laptop so long as you have an internet connection and you can go and you can you can uh, do some research on something, right? So it, it can be anything that you can find on Google, on any search engine, uh, commercial imagery. So that's what I was talking about with like uh, Google Earth or Google Maps. Um, these are commercial satellites that you can that you can use so that you can uh, gain something of unclassified that as it's unclassified, but it can become of intelligence value when you combine these things and you're you're trying to accomplish a, a particular mission. Um, counterintelligence and all source intelligence, they rely on STEM for every single source intelligence form. So like the, there's nothing in the field of military intelligence that is going to get away from STEM. Like we all rely on STEM in our own different ways. Uh, when it comes to the single sources of intelligence, uh, they have specific systems that are the product of years of advances in, uh, in STEM fields. And then when you get to like counterintelligence and all source intelligence, they bounce off of all the other single source of intelligence. So they, they're 100% uh, reliant on, on STEM as well. And then for uh, human intelligence, you have different data repositories that we use. So uh, uh, online uh, repositories where we store information and where we can share information. Um, we rely on secure communications and of course uh, surveillance technology, whether you're talking about video surveillance, you're talking about listening surveillance, stuff like that. So no matter what field you're talking about in military intelligence, 100% we all need STEM or we would not have jobs and we would not be able to accomplish the missions that we do. So we're going to go in just a little bit into the uh, five dimensions of contemporary warfare. So uh, dimension number one, uh, land. So we're talking about ground and vehicle-based operations. 
Uh, and I, I tied in a little bit of like what the uh, different capabilities are and how they they rely on STEM. So as you can see in the pictures to the right, I mean, small arms, so we're talking about your your firearms, your, your rifles, your machine guns, stuff like that. On a little bit of a larger scale, you're talking about artillery uh, and then surface to air missiles, surface to surface missiles. Um, but also, if you look in the picture on the left, uh, you can see some pretty massive antennas out there in the background. You see a big parabolic dish and a big uh, dome antenna. So these are all things that are based on, on the ground. And if it wasn't for STEM, like the, these are advances that we would not have been able to make, especially in recent years. We're talking within like the last 30 years, there's been you know drastic leaps and bounds in terms of improvements that we've made on the battlefield, in terms of uh, combat effectiveness, and also keeping people safe and making sure we can accomplish our mission. And uh, just uh, to, to preface, uh, all these photos I took, I was gonna just look for stock photos, but I, I thought that would be kind of cheating. So these are all pictures that I've taken and we can talk about them a little bit more later on once we once we have some time. But I did have to get a couple stock photos when it comes to a couple things, so we'll get there. Uh, the next dimension is, uh, is C, right? So we're talking about uh, surface and subsurface warfare. So any type of uh, naval ships, and uh, submarines that we're that we're dealing with. So uh, the the middle picture on the right is uh, me uh, paddling in an in inflatable raft. So that's obviously on like the the smallest scale when it comes to uh, see the the sea dimension, the naval dimension of warfare. And then uh, the the picture above is actually a it's like a hybrid aircraft carrier. So if you look really closely, you can see that there's helicopters on the top of it. It's actually a uh, you you can take off uh, on on fighter jets and stuff off the top of that. Um, so this is kind of like all encompassing anything that involves uh, naval operations. And then in terms of like STEM advancements we're talking about, we're talking about mounted guns, we're talking about uh, air defense artillery, torpedoes, uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles. I mean, we're, the, the, if, it, if it wasn't for STEM, like the, this, we'd, we'd be in the stone ages right now, you know? So this is, this is stuff that really relies on advancements in, uh, in the STEM field. Uh, the next dimension is air. So we're talking about fixed wing, rotary, and unmanned aerial vehicles. So uh, you're talking about fixed wing aircraft is like uh, the picture in the top left. It's like your traditional uh, airplane that we think of. It could be like a commercial airplane or like a fighter jet in that top left picture. Uh, rotary wing is uh, helicopters. So there's a couple of different helicopters in there, uh, whether it's a cargo helicopter to the right or uh, like a troop transport, which is in the bottom left. And uh, one of those people sliding down the rope is, is me in that bottom left picture. Um, you know, these, these aircraft are armed with cannons. They can drop bombs, they can shoot rockets, anti-tank missiles, uh, precision guided missiles, air to air missiles. Like it's, it's a lot of cool stuff. It's actually, it's actually fascinating. And when, when you get the opportunity to work with uh, people that do this stuff, it's, it's incredible stuff. And then cyber, now I, I, had to, I had to deviate from the norm here. I had to get a couple stock images because, you know, in the bottom right, like there's a picture of me looking menacing with a laptop. I figured I'd include that. That's a picture of me in Iraq. Uh, when it comes to cyber, we're talking about network security and we're talking about cyber warfare. Uh, you know, primarily we're talking about espionage, sabotage, and uh, people trying to tamper with power grids, stuff like that. So uh, any type of major hacking that uh, that could take place. And this is a new dimension of the battlefield. You know, so again, we're talking about within like the last few decades, this is stuff that really became prevalent, you know, that wasn't prevalent just, you know, uh, even 10 or 15 years ago, like it might not have been as much uh, of as much importance as it is right now. Um, so with with enough time and with advancements and, you know, in particular, like the internet and stuff like that and networks that we use and different systems that we use online, uh, people started to realize that there's serious vulnerabilities and that, you know, if you don't take uh, cybersecurity seriously, that, you know, you can be prone to getting hacked and that uh, your systems can actually be very vulnerable. Uh, and it's not just, you know, somebody that could compromise your your location or your social security number, for example, it's some, somebody that might have the means to shut down a power grid so that nobody has access to power. So this is actually a, a new dimension of the contemporary battlefield, but it's of the utmost importance and it would not exist without STEM. And then finally space, which is uh, one of my favorite things. It's what I do uh, for the job that I'm currently working. Again, these are stock images. I did not take these pictures with my phone, but the bottom right picture is actually a, a satellite picture of my house. If you can look close enough, you might find my house in there somewhere. And that is actually a, uh, well, the house I grew up in, I don't live there anymore. But uh, that, that, that is actually like a, a sample image of like the type of satellite imagery that I would use on a day-to-day -day basis. So when it comes to the space dimension of warfare, we're talking about satellite and rocket technology. So any of the satellites that are orbiting the earth right now that are just taking constant pictures, uh, you know, every time they, they fly a circle around the earth, 
Um, and then rocket technology, you're talking about intercont intercontinental ballistic missiles or uh, anti-satellite missiles, space to space weapons, earth to space weapons, and uh, space to earth weapons. Now, these things are more theoretical uh, when it comes to arming space because we're not actually not supposed to be uh, militarizing space right now. So it's kind of a sensitive topic. You know, some of our adversaries might be uh, doing it, so we have to keep our eyes on it, but it's not something that's supposed to be happening. However, if you have a satellite that's been orbiting the Earth for like the last 20 or 30 years and it's no longer functional, uh, you do have the means to uh, shoot it down because it's just kind of taking up space. Um, and then in the more uh, deeper advancements that we're talking about, we're talking about hypersonic missiles and uh, hypersonic vehicles, uh, which are a couple of the pictures that are off to the right. Um, so space is the newest dimension, I guess you could say, and it has become more of a focus in recent time. And uh, so that's where we stand. So it is the uh, fifth and final dimension of the contemporary battlefield. Um, so other STEM-oriented mil military careers, uh, obviously, as the name would suggest, uh, there's engineering, uh, there's different job availabilities in, uh, in medical, uh, air defense, cybersecurity, uh, explosive ordnance disposal. Uh, a lot of chemistry goes into that. If uh, you're looking to do anything like diffuse bombs, very interesting stuff. Uh, electronics and avionics. So uh, this, this, any, any, any vehicles that you know have any type of hardwiring, any type of aviation that requires uh, any, any type of hardwiring, uh, very important. Field artillery. So we're talking about like long, long range ordnance. Uh, signal core. So anything that's involving communications, uh, the ability to communicate all around the world. Uh, Seaburn is chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. So it's uh, kind of like um, chemical and uh, how do we say it's uh, you're dealing with a lot of gases and stuff. <laughs> the gas chamber. Everybody, everybody that's a veteran knows about the gas chamber. Uh, nuclear power and propulsion. Uh, we're we're talking about like nuclear powered uh, uh, submarines and stuff like that. Submarines being the next point. Anything involving aviation or space. Uh, radar and sonar technology. Uh, oceanography. Cryptology, which is just basically the ability to encrypt or decrypt uh, communications and uh, electronic warfare. So these are just a few examples of other, other career fields in the military that rely on STEM, but there's basically nothing that we do in the military that uh, would be possible without STEM. And finally, here's just a bunch of pictures of me just doing different stuff. And at this point, I will take questions. But with this slide, I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to touch briefly on um, you know, they kind of go sequentially. So like from the left, that's me in the Marine Corps. And then as you go a little bit further, like the central pictures are me in Africa. And then as you get to the right, it's uh, me and me and the army at present. And um, where I wanted to go with this really is like uh, everything that you're doing right now, like every, every em emphasis that you put on education is going to dictate what you do in the future. Like when I was in, you know, middle school or high school, like I didn't really take school that seriously. And then by the time I was about to graduate, like people were saying like, you know, Hey, you, you should get serious about going to college. And I was like, no, 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 I'm going to join the military. Like this is, this is the only thing that I want to do. And so it just so happened that I, I found what I was interested in and I found my niche, which was in military intelligence. And what the Marine Corps gave me was the opportunity to travel the world. I had never been on an airplane before. Now I've been to dozens of different countries. I've lived abroad for seven or eight years as an aggregate total. Um, I've rafted the River Nile. I've climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. I can do handstands on hands. <laughs> I, I can walk on my hands. And you know, all of these things are actually possible because of the time that I spent in the Marine Corps, which opened doors and new possibilities to what I was going to do at the next uh, chapter of my life. And then eventually I decided to come back into the military because I kind of missed it. And I, I wanted to get back into the field of military intelligence. So for those students that are watching, uh, your interest in STEM right now could very well dictate where you go, uh, you know, later on in your in your life, in your career, your professional life and personal life. So uh, continue to take it seriously. Uh, keep that fire burning. Anything is possible. It doesn't matter who you are, or where you're from. You can accomplish everything that you set out to do. And uh, I'm kind of a living example of that. So at that point, thank you guys. It has really been a pleasure. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'm I'm here. Yeah, we'll head over to Mr. Rivera's class. Um, are your students prepared to unmute and come talk to the microphone? Yes, we are. Tristan, All right. your questions you heard. Uh, my question is, um, when you, do you have to go to college to get to join it, to join the Army? 
You do it's not. Right. So, I'll show you in my slides too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So you you do not need you do not need to have college in order to join. If you want to be an officer, you're going to have to have a degree. Um, while you're on active duty, you can actually go to school. So the the military will pay for you to go to school. Um, and even if you don't want to be an officer, like for example, I have two degrees. I'm not an officer, so you can either come to the table with college. You can come to the table with no college and have the military pay for it, or you can show up already with a degree and then you can just have a different uh, job availability when you get there. Great question. question. Do you have another one? Or would you like to? Oh yeah, cool code talker, I forgot. Lynette. Do you have another question, Mr. Rivera's class or would you like us to it's move just, on? We lost technology, sorry. Go ahead, Davis. Which one's you in the boat? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> so uh -huh. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but this is me. So the very front person that hasn't fallen into the water yet with kind of a pinkish helmet, that right there is me. And that that smile is me trying not to panic, but I knew we were uh, we were going over at that point. <laughs>